Hi guys, welcome to the Revive Stronger podcast. I'm your host, as always, Steve Hall. And today I'm very happy to have Chris Berica back on the show. Uh, He was last on the show, um, I just have it up here, on episode 187. So that's quite a while ago, actually. It doesn't feel like that long ago. I kind of keep up with you on social media and everything. So it doesn't feel like ages since I've interacted with you, but that's got to be like months and months ago and that was on exercise selection. So I think this is actually only your second time on the show and uh, there will definitely be many more times that you're on here uh, if you'll be willing to come back on it. Chris is, if you don't know who Chris is, uh, he is a bodybuilder himself where he's going to be talking a lot about contest prep and actually his own prep. Uh, He hasn't competed in quite some time so it's going to be exciting to see him step on stage hopefully this year. Uh, All things going nice and smoothly as they should do in the world. Uh, He is also a coach and also a scientist so uh, he does does his own research um, and is well equipped to coach uh, people to stage and himself. So I'm very excited to talk about this. And I guess uh, kind of starting with, uh, I guess, uh, what was it, four years since you last like seriously dieted to stage? Is that right, Chris? Yeah, man. Yeah. And, and again, Steve, thanks so much for having me on. I thoroughly enjoy conversing with you and I look forward to doing this again for sure. So yeah, it's been a while, dude. I haven't competed since July of 2017. Um, so by the time I step on stage, it's going to be slightly over four years and, um, I'm excited for it. It's every prep is so different though, like psychologically and yeah, just, there's so many different layers to it that I'm sure we'll get into. Um, but it's been quite a while. The three and a half year off season was not perfect by any means. There's a lot of ups and downs. Um, but I know I have added tissue on my physique. I kind of just can feel it when I'm palpating certain areas. So um, I'm excited to get back into it Um, more so for myself, like more than anything, just really feel like I've challenged myself in other ways the past three and a half years. And uh, it's time for me to kind of shift focus on something that's like very internal and something that gives me an opportunity to be really introspective um, uh, there's something about contest prep that's like super intimate, like with yourself. Um, and um, that's what I'm looking forward to more so than like, I honestly don't care too much to step on stage. Like I'm definitely like, that's the end goal, but it's not necessarily about like competing on stage against others. It's, it's more so about the process right now. So, um, in some ways that excites me in some ways that like has me questioning, like, why am I doing this again? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Yeah, it's one of those it is in its own right, like an extreme sport. So there's something appealing, like there's a reason people bungee jump and like, I don't know, go underwater with sharks or whatever, just these like extreme activities, just like, why do you want to do that? That just sounds completely like torture, actually. Um, but there's something kind of, it just gives you something, the process. I'm, I'm the same. It's actually funny. Now I reflect on it, 2017 is when I was last on stage as well. And I've just started my prep for this season as well. I did intend to compete last year, but that was a complete like <laughs> shit show really for a lot of people. So I just ended up ducking out. Uh, but that's something I wanted to actually talk about for you was uh, talking about kind of the reason why. And actually, I really like that. I think a lot of us look up to potentially like people who are more so the pros, not to say that you're not an excellent competitor. You are, you definitely are, and you're going to bring a fantastic physique, but you don't have it at the forefront of your mind. Like I've got to turn pro. I need to be like a whatever WMBF pro, whatever it is that that has to be the goal. And you're like yeah. writing it on your kind of whiteboard every day. Um, I bring that up because I always think of Matt Ogus doing that in like one of his vl- like old vlogs. He'd always write it like on his whiteboard, like WMBF pro or oh, just a yeah. pro. Um, and I, I'm sure he's kind of his mindset has matured and everything now and he very much enjoys the process too he may even be stepping on stage that's a whole nother person and topic um and hopefully he'll listen to this and maybe he'll come on the podcast sometime kind of peer pressure him a little bit with you chris yeah but for you you talked about yeah the process and i think that's super refreshing because i think a lot of people feel pressured to like oh i've got to be like have that goal of winning my shows and uh, kind of going pro and if i i don't have that as like my main driver i I don't know i'm a failure and if i don't achieve that again i'm a failure and yeah something i wanted to talk about was that kind of you said uh, in a post you're like for you it's more than wanting kind of the mental growth more than the physical outcome uh, and i don't know if there's like any specifics that that like comes to mind in terms of that yeah um there's a lot that there's so much to talk about man so first like my previous contest prep was very very driven around turning pro 
um, even in 2013. So I competed in 2011, I competed in 2013. And in 2013, I was only 21. And like, I was so pro card hungry, like that's all I would think about. And that really drove the purpose of the prep. Um, and it was very interesting because, you know, any, it doesn't really matter. But if I were to turn pro when I was 21, I would have got crushed on a pro stage anyway, but I was still focused on like earning that pro card. And then in 2017, I thought, okay, you know, I've matured. My physique has improved. I'm older. I've, this is my third season. So I'm still focused on this pro card. It was still like at the forefront. And I think something that like, I think what ended up happening made me not value the pro card as much um, because I took first in an NPC show here in Florida. And then I took in my, in my weight class, in my categories. And then I took second in New York, um, at the INBF Hercules, which is always a superb show in, in New York city. Um, and I took second there rightfully. So like no questions asked. And then I took second at the, the California muscle mayhem, which was eh, maybe questionable, but um, long story short, I realized like it, it didn't really matter. I was just really happy that I brought my best. I actually remember taking progress photos one morning, like one week out from my, from the, uh, the Hercules show, the second show of the season, my glutes were just like, in like, I've never seen them before. And literally I said, I, I'm like, I don't have to compete. Like I'm totally yeah. happy right now. I don't need to step on stage and like the job has been done. And I just didn't, I didn't think my physique could get any better that season. Um, so I was totally satisfied with that. And now it's like, I know people that hold that pro card status that, you know, honestly might not really be that competitive. And then um, I know that there are pros out there that have just incredible genetics on just a totally different level. And then I know that there are some other amateurs, like my buddy, Matt, as you mentioned, like we're both amateurs, but I do think we both have pro physique, so to speak. And we would yeah. definitely do well, like do decent on a pro stage. Right. So it just depends, man. But something that's so interesting about the sport is that there are some people with subpar genetics that can really like that can beat people with better genetics if they really come in at a hundred percent. And that's something that that motivates me from a competitive sense. So even though this is like a me versus me thing, um, I do find it motivating that, Hey, even though there are people out there that probably have had a better deck of cards dealt to them, um, I can kind of close the door shut if they leave that opportunity open for me to come in, you know, so that drives me, man. Um, but yeah, sorry, I kind of just went on a ramble. I forgot if there was a particular question. No, I mean, that, that it's cool to hear that. I always, I remember reading an article by Lyle McDonald ages ago. It was kind of had like uh, genetics and then like work ethic slash like intelligent training. And it was like, you have like prima donna or like the ones that do both or something. It was like different work, like different horses and it had like the work horse and all these. So you could be someone with like average genetics, but work incredibly hard and smart and do just as well with someone with top tier genetics who kind of are a bit laissez-faire about it. They're not really committed. They're not necessarily keeping up with the best training philosophies and putting in their, all their effort. Maybe they miss meals or skip weeks of training, that sort of thing. So yeah. uh, definitely that's something that appealed to me because I think a lot of us get into it because we enjoy sports and things, but that relies on like the team and everything and how that's all going. Whereas I always liked kind of bodybuilding, everything I put into it, I got out of it and that was under my control. And it's kind of like, that's part of like contest prep every day. It's like take each day as like a challenge, like ticking those boxes. There's something unbelievably rewarding about being like, I don't know, you could have a crappy day, but if you've like hit your macros, done your cardio, done your training, like it's, it's a good day from a bodybuilding perspective. Yeah. Depositing pennies as uh, Jeff Alberts would put it. <laughs> yeah, hundred percent, man. And that's funny. You mentioned that um, I used to play basketball when I was younger and I just, I used to practice literally 10, 15, 20 times more than any of my teammates. So it was like super frustrating. Um, and then I started competing way after, you know, after that, when I was 19, uh, 19 years old. And that's what drove me about bodybuilding. It's like, okay, as long as I work hard, um, the progress is in my hands. And then, you know, yeah, there are some things that limit us, but 
just put in the work, put your head down and, and, and you will get better. And that's all that I really cared about. Yeah. And I think something you mentioned there as well, in terms of like having like at the moment, you're like Matt and yourself, like having those kind of pro caliper physiques, but not yet turn pro that doesn't like discount your physiques anymore. It's just the opportunity hasn't yet presented itself. Like you can get lucky and you can play your cards right and do a certain show or do lots of shows and maybe someone doesn't turn up and somehow the cards fall in your favor. 100%. But that's a bit of a, for me, that's a, a weird game to play because that's not really what it's about. I feel maybe a little bit like, I don't know, I've just been lucky here rather than I've earned it. And it sounds like that's the driving force for you for competing is like earning that pro card status. Yeah, man. I, I mean, for some reason, I'm, I'm still not putting like a ton of value on earning that pro card. Um, it's weird. Like as long as I'm significantly better and I'm happy with my side by side, I'm cool. And yeah. I just feel like if you continuously bring a pro physique to the stage, you'll eventually get rewarded. But I'm not like, that's not the carrot that's dangling in front of me. It's like, it's no longer that, but it definitely used to be like without a doubt, without a shadow of a doubt. Um, so it's interesting to see how things have evolved and transformed. And um, yeah, there's so, there's so many factors that come into play. And where are you now in terms of uh, kind of body weight? Um, how many weeks out are you? What's your previous or predicted or previous and predicted stage weight? Okay. Yeah, that's, that's interesting. Right now I'm uh, I was 179 this morning, 179. And um I am 17 weeks out this Saturday. So after tomorrow, um, I'll be 17 weeks out this Saturday, maybe 16 weeks out if I want to do a show beforehand. Um, that's something I'll chat about. But I do predict I, I probably need to get to 160. And last time I was 156. So I think I have a good 17 to 19 pounds to lose. Um, I've hit lows of 177 so far today, which is, you know, slightly higher, but, um, yeah, I probably have like a good 17 pounds of fat to lose. Um, I'm nervous that it might be more than that, but <laughs> it's, it's really tough to tell at this, at this phase. I feel like it's easier to tell when you're like eight to 10 pounds away, but when you're over 15 pounds, like, eh, it's, it's pretty hard to predict. And I've utilized every tool in my disposal to try to get an idea of where, what I would be. <laughs> every assessment's different. So um, I've done a DEXA scan. I've used bioelectrical impedance. I've had a really skilled clinician do the seven site skin calipers, and it all gives you slightly different numbers. Um, but yeah, man, I just want to be better than 2017. And I really don't want to dip below 160. There is that, that ego yeah. and that mental thing. I'm um, like, fuck, I, it's been four years. I should at least add four pounds of stage weight. Um, so we'll see. Time will tell. Time will tell. Yeah. No, it's, re it's actually, I mean, that's a whole topic in itself in terms of the different body composition measurements and the fact that they're all different and you're, it's not yeah. sure if it's really being helpful for you. And I guess as a, like you said, as a bodybuilder, what are you being judged on? None of those numbers. It's how you look. And as you get closer to that look, you get more and more, you, you know, more and more where kind of that kind of the, the bullseye is going to be in terms of body weight for you. Um, yeah. And then in terms of actually the number of weeks, I guess you have there for some people, I think that will sound incredibly reasonable. Um, I imagine for some people, maybe they think it sounds, I don't know, a bit not that not enough, maybe um, um, given, I guess it became more popular for people to have more time for you. Is that, do you feel like you've, you've calculated it? That's definitely like the time that you want to have, or have you, uh, and is it less or more than previous preps? Yeah, um, that's a great question, man. So I don't like super dragged out preps, even if you're utilizing diet breaks. Um, for me, I, I question the physical benefits to the potential psychological risk. So for me to stay in the trenches for a super, super long period of time, um, I just don't think it would necessarily warrant a better physique. And I think it would just make certain parts of my life more stressful. Um, so we already know that this is a selfish sport. So just trying to make sure that your timeline is appropriate, not just for the physical, but also like psychological relationships, mental stuff, just even timeline of like what I want to be doing by the end of the year. Um, I'll talk about that super quick too, because 
I plan on competing in September and maybe like the first two weeks of October and totally shutting it down right, right after that. I'm not going to extend the season. Um, and the reason for that is I really want to focus on like, so everyone knows that worlds is always in November with the WMBF. And once I compete, regardless of how I do, I have a lot of athletes doing WMBF worlds. And the last thing I want is trying to juggle my competition and like peak week while trying to coach like seven, eight other people, you know? So I'm kind of just shutting it down. Um, for so many reasons, but yeah, I just, I don't want a super, super long prep. I gave myself 21 weeks, um, to basically lose like 22 pounds. I was like 182 at the beginning ish. Um, and I, th I think that's a reasonable rate of loss and it also forces you to just get the shit done. Um, sometimes people like doing like that open-ended prep, which can be advantageous depending on, is this your first show? Is this your second season? you know, have you done this over and over? Do you know how hard it's going to be as you get leaner and leaner? Um, I feel like I know exactly what to expect at the certain time periods throughout the prep. So um, I kind of like giving myself like a hard stop and like a uh, an end point of like, this is when you need to be your best. So, you know, find a way to make it happen by that day. I, I really like that explanation. I think I particularly like it because you brought up the fact of like a uh, first time competitor versus someone who's done it many times and you've done it many times. So your calculation of how much time you're going to need, like driving a, a journey to somewhere where if you've never been there before, you're not like sure you might take a wrong turn or you might not exactly know how the traffic's going to be at a certain point. Whereas when you've done the journey multiple times, like, yeah, I, I pretty much know it's going to be in this ballpark time. And I think, uh, I know, uh, I think it was, um, uh, Peter Fitchin said basically like a contest prep as long as you've got as many weeks as many pounds as you've got to lose or a bit more preferably like that's a pretty golden spot to be in and I'm I'm very much the same with my prep like I, I look at it, it makes me a little bit anxious because I don't have a ton of time before my first show but I know I mean given I almost competed last year I wasn't too far away from stage condition it kind of I already know like I need to be confident in it and like you said when you have a shorter time period like as long as you're that person that can get shit done, like yeah. you'll get it done. Uh, yeah. And something you brought up there, I also wanted to touch on was like relationships. Um, and I don't know if you had any, you can, I think you had something to say there. So I don't want to move on to like a topic before I let you speak. So um, did you have anything on that? I just, no, I wanted to say you looked fantastic last year. I saw oh, I some YouTube that. videos and I remember there was one video you were posing. You're like, yeah, I think I have like X amount of pounds to lose. And I was like, <laughs> hey, do you have like, half of that and you're going to be like fully in so yeah you just you looked fantastic so i'm excited to see how how things you know come about for you i appreciate that yeah it was with that's the i guess the advantage of seeing like andrew Chappelle, who's a, a pro and obviously steph noble as well and they like it gave me a lot of confidence when they were like yeah i think you have like five pounds to lose not like 10 or more than that yeah. it's like oh okay cool because <laughs> uh, uh yeah um it's just great to have people in the in your corner who can give you that confidence as well so yeah, the thing I want to talk about was, um, and I think for a lot of more mature competitors, they tend to be a bit older and they have maybe family or they have like wives, um, they have relationships that they need to take care of and they can't be quite like it's selfish, like you said, but when you're a teenager or when you're like in your early twenties and you're just like, I don't know, you're single and you just work for your, I don't know, you have your job or whatever, you can be quite selfish if you want to be. And so like there are some elements within relationships that can quite easily take like a backseat, like, I don't know, going out to eat, things like this. Um, so I'd love to hear about some of the things that you're, I don't know, I, I know one of them was kind of at the moment, you've kind of got a, a bit of a flexible meal plan in that your evening dinners are consumed with your wife and things like this. So I'd love to hear a bit more about kind of the struggles of that and what you're kind of planning it already. Yeah, yeah, for sure. So um, like for me personally, like my wife and I love going out to eat on the weekends, like just going out and about, and you know taking a walk on the shore going to a boardwalk whatever it may be enjoying the florida weather and grabbing a lunch grabbing a dinner while we're out and about um so right now i'm taking a pretty interesting approach where monday through friday i'm basically on a meal plan where four out of my five meals are just the same every day my pre and post doesn't really change my other two meals don't change um but dinner around 6 p.m changes almost every day um, but my macro targets for that meal are the same. So just the food sources are changing. So like, 
you know, um, yesterday I had chicken breast with rice and lentils and guacamole, but tonight it's probably going to be potatoes with a steak. So like that meal is always changing because we're still trying to like make dinner at home and have that meal together. So the macros are accounted for and they're basically equal like all the time. Um, but that one meal is different like throughout the week. And then I'm still in this uh, phase right now where <clears throat> On the weekends, I'm still trying to be more flexible. So on the weekends, I'm not following a meal plan unless I end up training Saturday and Sunday. Um, I'll do like the same pre and post that I always do. But then I am still trying to go out and make things work outside. Um, I just started bringing a food scale when eating out, um, but I'm still trying to be a little bit more flexible. And then if I get to a certain point at prep where I feel like those two days are negatively impacting my rate of progress or things just aren't accounted for um, to the precision needed, then I'll make the change. But for right now, I kind of want to extend that out um, until I feel like I can no longer do it. So yeah, I'm trying to I'm trying to make this a pretty flexible prep in certain ways and just approach it with the experience that you know I have accumulated over the past 10 years and, and see how I can do because I was always I would always hear like other veterans in the sport like Alberto Nunez and Jeff Alberts and even my buddy Rich Kroll like my buddy Rich Kroll wouldn't even really track like he would just do his whole prep by feel and you know he's been doing this for maybe 30 years too so like when you've been doing it for so long you kind of become very in tune with your body. Um, so I'm trying to see how I can practice that and, and implement it throughout my prep um, and see to kind of see how it goes. Yeah. Hey, Pascal here. I just wanted to take the moment to talk about our membership site. Inside, you'll find a thriving forum, an extensive exercise library, courses, presentations, and research reviews. All I need you to do is hit the link in the description below and sign up. Cool, I think it's... It's actually incredible to see how many things that we align with in terms of the way I'm approaching things it's very similar, like through the week, just having right. that roboticness of just like meal plan, it, it sets you up well for your training, you know what you need. And then the evening dinner to have with the girlfriend or the, the wife in your case, it, it makes life like, uh, like tenable. I know for me personally, there becomes a time where like I want that dinner at a particular time and like if there's a yeah. delay or something and like as you're approaching like those the final I don't know hopefully even 10 weeks out it's not such a, a deal but it just gets a little bit trickier to kind of do those flexible meals and things and same with the weekend as well but it, it's nice to hear that you as someone who is taking this very seriously and you want the best results and you're part, part of the reason you're doing it is actually for the best results because you realize yeah. like psychology comes into it you're not just, I know a lot of people go into this where it's just like, oh, I'm in prep. That means lockdown, no socials, no nothing. I'm kind of in this zone. Uh, and yeah, I guess for you, in terms of eating out, are you kind of picking particular restaurants? Are you being selective about that? Or are you being as flexible as you can be to like align with, I guess, not putting your prep ahead of uh, yeah. like a relationship? Or I guess in a way, she'd be probably very happy and amenable to you kind of picking yeah. certain areas no right now it's been it's been pretty easy um i haven't even really need to select particular restaurants i mean we both enjoy eating at really like micronutrient dense places anyway so they usually just have something on the menu that's lower calorie higher protein or you just you literally ask for double protein or you ask for all the sauces on the side so on and so forth so there's there's kind of ways to go about it and it's also important, like, there's no way I would have been able to attempt this my second season or my first season. Um, maybe I could have pulled it off in 2017. But again, you, you have a different mentality and you have a different level of experience. So um, it's not something I would recommend for like a beginner to do. I think there's something to be gained and there's a ton of value in being super strict and regimented um, earlier on in your career. And then you can kind of learn when you need to pick and choose that level of precision. Yeah. Yeah. yeah I guess you just become much, 
like uh, the saying goes, like you track to eventually not track, like you're calculating all the numbers in your head if you're yeah. looking at a meal, no matter what you do there. And actually, you, you had a really cool post and I appreciated this because a lot of people look up to Dorian um, and you should kind of had that clip from uh, Fjord's, uh, Fjord's podcast, uh, which yeah. I'm sure lots of the listeners will listen to. And he's like known for being like hardcore down the line, but he was having this like chocolate bar in his prep like as a as just a, a thing and i'd love to hear just i guess this is a very non-specific question but more of your thoughts surrounding kind of like i think a lot of us get trapped into that like kind of more is better like more hardcore more restrictive yeah. uh, mentality when in reality we can we can do it like like dorian did and he yeah. enjoyed some of his diet i loved hearing that because a lot of those bodybuilders from that era because social media didn't exist so many people make assumptions on how they approach certain things. Like we know that he trained balls to the wall in the gym and we understand like his high intensity approach there, but we really didn't have much information on his diet. So I think a lot of people just made assumptions that, Oh, he's a hardcore person in the gym. That means he's never having a chocolate bar or um, he's just on a meal plan and he's not even thinking about, you know, macronutrients, whatever it may be. Um, and that's not true. Like, I love the fact that he a shared that on a podcast in today's realm, because it's probably going to get other people to question their things. And he also used the word quota. He said, yeah, the calories within that chocolate bar fit my quota. That's the same exact thing as saying the calories or macronutrients in that chocolate bar fit my macronutrient target for the day. Like it was the same exact thing, just viewed slightly differently. Um, and I think that's really valuable for up and coming bodybuilders and maybe those that have been doing it for a while, but have kind of put themselves inside this one box where it's like, this is the way it needs to be done. Um, and it's, it's just not necessarily true. So even um, the way I'm currently approaching things is a little bit different because I used to be really specific with nailing my macros to the T. Um, so like, let's say my macros are 60 fat, 300 carb, 240 protein. Like I would need to hit 240 protein and 300 carb right. back in the day. But right now, if I'm at 290 carb, I'm like, okay, fine. If I'm at 232 protein. I'm not going to like go have one spoon of Greek yogurt just to get eight more grams of protein, you know, where in the past, I used to be a little bit crazy about it. And again, I think there's learning experience that's, that come from that, but um, it's, it's been nice to not be as stressed out about this shit right now yeah i think the the ranges of like and tightening the ranges in terms of like macros is freeing for a lot of people even though like i mean it sounds i don't know p people listening might think oh it sounds like chris is really like loosened up but it's like no, no, no there's still like really strict like parameters going on tracking body weight making sure that you're tracking along all right you're hitting your protein you're definitely yeah. getting sufficient minimum protein yeah. uh so yeah it's, but it's nice to know like and I've, ha I've had clients who have been like wanting to hit specific numbers. I'm like, even if you hit those, like there's, there's no extra benefit. You don't get a brownie point for hitting that number on my fitness pal. Sure. Uh, and even that number might be off because nutritional values, uh, depending on what you're eating can be off. Mm -hmm. Um, and I guess, um, that's where right now the, the, having the more flexible approach is okay. But towards the end, is that something you like to rein in a little bit because of the variables, and the variants of different foods and also how you react somewhat. Is that something you will tie up towards the end? Yeah. So like right now, my food sources are, are super similar on a day-to-day -day basis. One thing that I think will be valuable for the listeners is like you mentioned, just because you're nailing your numbers to the T on, on my fitness pal doesn't actually mean you hit those exact numbers because there can be variances in the food. Um, especially if you're eating, you know, a processed snack. So something that you're scanning, like they're allowed to have 20% nutritional variance there. So you can think that you nailed your numbers, but you may not have. And at the end of the day, it doesn't, it doesn't actually matter that much. Um, but where was I going to go with this? Um, oh, because I eat primarily whole foods, I feel like it's way more precise. Yeah. And a lot of, I've worked with clients in the past um, and I've seen some friends in the past that would do their contest preps in a very flexible way from a nutrition standpoint, where they're eating different processed foods on a regular basis, and they're eating different food sources on a regular basis. And what that leads to is like really skewed weigh-ins and a much 
harder time to actually track and monitor progress. So I do not recommend that um, because I'm eating similar food sources at similar quantities on a daily basis. My weigh-ins are way more accurate in regards to what's going on. Whereas if you're eating different foods on a daily basis that have different food volume, even if your macros are the same, um, your weigh-ins are going to be skewed. And then your ability to make decisions at the right time is going to be a bit harder. So yeah, man, I, I do keep it relatively basic, but it has evolved over time. So yeah. Yeah, I guess that's like one of those things you experience, like, you know, if you eat out at a particular restaurant or something and it's very high sodium, maybe you ate later than usual, then you know the next day data weigh-in is going to be a bit skewed. So you can take that into consideration. But like you said, if you're a first-time competitor and you do that, that could, and you are just like, oh, if my scale weight weekly average does this, no matter what variance in my food there was, I'm going to do this. And you might end up making the wrong call because something skewed your data that you're not realizing has skewed the data. Right. Um, and yeah, that's why I think particularly I'm a big fan of towards like the latter part of prep, just like really simplifying things down. Cause like the variance on the scale you're looking for is so small then, cause you're trying to lose such small amounts. 100%. If you start messing around and I did it in past prep. So I was like super diet fatigued. So I was like, oh yeah, I'll do all the like, I don't know, the Weight Watchers this and the like, uh, yeah. what was the Walden Farms? I did all the Walden Farms and like the yeah. crazy sodium content that's in some of those. Um, and they can start just like, yeah, leading to data just being super unhelpful. And even like photos, they just get like smoothed out because yeah. you're just holding on to so much water. For sure. Did you ever do any of the like Walden Farms and? <laughs> never, man. Never. No. Yeah. Um, I'm weird. Um. I've never got into even like diet sodas. Oh, really? Um, yeah, seltzer waters. Um, never got into Walden's Farms or like these sauces that people use. I'm like, I'm pretty boring, man. I'm pretty damn boring. Just yeah, like I don't know. Cucumbers. I don't know why. <laughs> I, I don't know. It's it's interesting. Maybe when I go out to eat, I I might challenge myself to do like a diet soda instead of a a water. But literally, all I drink is water. <laughs> I don't know why, but yeah, that's how I've been. I think if anything, that's the healthier option. If, if not that we're saying like artificial sweeteners are necessarily unhealthy, but I mean, for your teeth, everything like water is yeah. probably the, the way to go. So I think yeah. more people are probably like, I wish I could just stick to water all the time. Yeah. It probably sounds enough, simple for you. We got enough artificial sweeteners in our pre-workout and our post-workout True. creatine and everything else that I think if you're consuming that stuff like all day long, it could be, you know, problematic to your gut health and then you have bloating and, you know, uh, bowel ir irregularities and then the whole nine. So yeah, I never got into that. Even, even some people, man, I remember like 2013, people were obsessed with chewing different flavor gums. Yeah. Like, oh, this tastes like a cinnamon bun and this tastes like ice cream. I'm like, dude, you're out of your mind. I'm like, <laughs> just drink your water, man. <laughs> I have one of those quite addictive personalities where yeah, I go, like I've said it to myself, like, if I have chewing gum, it's like one or two pieces a day. I'm not going through packets a day yeah. like this. Can't it sounds like a like I'm smoking or something like an unhealthy yeah. addiction. But You're obviously, like, oh, yeah. <laughs> but it, it happens actually, and I think that's probably partly like that's going to help your success with like the hedonic kind of drive for food, where you get that kind of palatable food, and then you just it drives your appetite up. So I know like yeah, and I've had clients who have had like Pepsi Max, and they've had like two liter bottles, and they're just like drinking that. And having one of those a day and I'm just like, oh my God, like just let alone everything else, the caffeine as well that you're like picking up through the day and it can quickly lead to, yeah, some nasty habits. I know like it's sugar-free jello is one that people end up just like piling it in. Yeah. Um, and yeah, it just, it doesn't lead to a good looking physique. Like you've, you, you've kind of made a good point of just like, keep it quite basic. It will help you in so many ways for a contest prep, like sticking to mostly whole foods, which I mean, should sound like a no brainer for a lot of people, hopefully. Yeah yeah yeah, for sure and some of you I, I think you shared a post actually from bill campbell and it was basically comparing like appetite and how you can manipulate meal frequency to potentially help you in a mass versus a cut i'd love to hear a bit more about that because i think that's something that people don't necessarily consider for sure for sure so sorry you hear that ding right that came through i have freaking i message on my computer so oh, no. <laughs> I, I have my phone on do not disturb but it still comes through on the computer so my bad um, but yeah, in regards to meal frequency, man, it's, it's one of those topics that doesn't get a lot of attention. And you know, I think it should 
honestly just uh, at least people need to think about it a little more. So for me, when I am in a surplus and I'm trying to gain, once my calories get above like 3,200, 3,000, I really need to shift to six meals per day um, just so I can comfortably get that food in and digest my meals well. Um, so a lot of the research on meal frequency is typically related to dieting down. And a lot of people will say that if you eat more frequently, your hunger is going to be increased. Your appetite is going to increase a bit, um, which is potentially true because you're eating smaller meals. Um, so you're getting less food volume in each feeding um, if you're in a deficit, right? So in that case, it might not be the best thing to have really high meal frequency when you're dieting. But it's actually something that I like need in my off season in order just to get in the appropriate amount of calories without ruining my digestive system. So if I did four meals per day in my off season and they were really large meals, um, a, my appetite would be trash. It, I wouldn't look forward to my next meal. And then B, I would question how well I'm digesting and absorbing those nutrients. And a lot of times I would, that would like kind of force you to go into training sessions still feeling full, even if it was like two hours post eating. Um, so I like having slightly smaller, but more frequent meals in my off season. And then when I contest prep, I actually decrease my meal frequency and it's not massive, but on my training days right now, I have five total feedings. And on my non-training days, I only have four. Um, and my four meals right now are pretty damn big and like super satiating. So um, I like utilizing what we know about meal frequency to our advantage rather than just saying like, there's no benefits to higher meal frequency when I think there is um, when lean gaining, um, even potentially in contest prep, and just knowing when to utilize it. Yeah, I think having been through enough gaining phases myself now, I can definitely relate to that where if you have like to eat, unless it's something like, I don't know, a pizza, but to get in over a thousand calories, like multiple times through the day, you just end up like being really stuffed and then it never really quite goes and then you're really stuffed whereas like small frequent meals it's kind of like oh, i'm just basically just about full every time you're just a bit like filling back up yeah. Um, whereas yeah for like it's nice during a, a prep or a diet to feel almost full every time at least or full versus yeah. like feel like you're nibbling on little like meals especially when you get on lower and lower calories i imagine for females in particular that would or just because females tend to die on fewer calories like mm -hmm. imagine six meals in a contest prep for a female they're on like i don't know 1500 calories it's like yeah that, that would be actually really difficult even to hit like losing thresholds and things like this which would cause problems as well <laughs> exactly where my mind was going i, I was going to say like i would rather a female eat you know 35 grams of protein four times per day or something like that then eat like 20 grams of protein six times per day whatever the numbers may be you know what i'm saying i'd rather them have more protein in each feeding um and decrease their frequency yeah. but another thing that's interesting is like my pre and post workout meals don't really change much from off season to contest prep um but the rate of that digestion is drastically different as i get leaner and leaner so like i can eat my pre-workout meal that's the same macros, same food sources, same total calories in my off season. And I feel like I need at least 90 minutes before I start my training session, um, even up to two hours, like before I start training. Whereas right now I'm feeling like I can go train after 60 minutes um, just because I, I've only been in a deficit for uh, what, three, four weeks now. Um, and I'm already realizing that I'm processing and digesting food at a faster rate. But I know like towards the end of prep, I'll eat that meal and be like 30 minutes later, like I can eat again. And like, I need to train like pretty darn quickly after that meal. So it's pretty interesting how your body literally prioritizes digestion um, to a greater degree when your energy reserves are depleted. So glycogen's low, body fat reserves are lower and lower. It's like you put food in that stomach and blood rushing to it. And, and that's the priority. Whereas you're in off season, all of those energy reserves aren't full. Your body's like, yeah, I'm not even going to worry about it. You can go sit on the couch and just chill out for a couple hours before I even start really tackling that, that meal. So it's pretty cool to see the difference. And, you know, you get those random questions from people. It's like, um, how long after a meal should I eat? 
I'm like, I have no idea. I don't know what you're eating. I don't know what phase you're in. I don't know how you're feeling. And there's so many things that you need to consider where, you know, you get plenty of those black and white questions where people want an answer. And I'm like, it depends on a lot of certain, a lot of factors for sure. Yeah. It's actually, it's super interesting. You mentioned that. I think, like, I think of some of the meals that I'm eating now. And I think if I ate that like a month ago, I just be like so bloated, so uncomfortable. Whereas now it's just like, it doesn't even like, it, it touches the sides. Like I uh, like you, I've not been dieting that long that I can like say sure. that I'm like, but you think to when you're, I don't know, like five weeks out and some of the meals you eat then and you're like, yeah, that, that's fine. It's not like crazy amounts of fiber, but if you ate that in your off season, it's weird. Yeah, I, I don't know what the mechanism is there. I don't know if you know, but you're completely right in that digestion. Just It seems, if anything, like you like just better when you're cutting and, uh, maybe that is, uh, I see that also. I, I wonder if you see it after like mini cuts, even when you do like an aggressive deficit and then you come out and for a while, there's like, there is a better digestion. You feel better. You kind of things move better. Yeah. Uh, I wonder if that that's something that's actually is propelling that sort of appetite and digestion. Yeah. It hasn't been like research. So like we wouldn't be sure exactly what the mechanism is, but I mean, theoretically or, or logically thinking about it just seems that when you're in a deficit for an extended period of time and those energy reserves are depleted, your body knows that those nutrients that you just consumed are more important to digest and utilize, you know, sooner than later. Whereas when your energy reserves are full in an off season, you put a meal in and it's like, just not the priority. Like it just yeah. doesn't matter as much. I guess that it just makes me think of uh, like depleting and then super compensating some sort of like, that kind of reason i don't know but yeah the just that mechanism within the body that's somewhat similar in in that sense so that's really really cool to hear about something something i'd be interested to hear about chris is you mentioned i think diet breaks um but also we can talk about refeeds there are things that i guess diet breaks are a little bit more of a modern kind of bodybuilder thought process whereas it refeeds have been around for for a long long time yeah how are you kind of where are your thoughts line with those how how do you think you're going to start if you're going to utilize either or how might you utilize them yeah i utilize them with a lot of my clients um again depending on how they're responding how they're feeling um physically psychologically mentally and like what their timeline is looking like so it depends um for me i would like to do at least one diet break um and my diet break would be no longer than seven days, but it could be as short as five. So I know some people feel like you have to at least take one full week or two weeks to consider a diet break. However you want to define it is fine. But um, I would like to take at least one diet break where I have, you know, five to seven days at whatever my new maintenance would be at that time. Um, and kind of see if my physique comes alive a bit more. But I don't want to go there until I start feeling like fatigue is actually set in and um, certain parts of certain parts of my physique maybe just aren't popping as much or I feel like maybe something's you know not uh, where it should be then I would utilize it but as of right now I'm just taking refeeds where I usually do two days back to back um, and that just depends on on a host of factors the scale how I'm looking um, my training activity and even like my need. So if need is going through the roof for whatever particular reason, maybe I'll have refeeds at that time. So a lot of factors, but I'm utilizing it myself. What about you, man? Yeah. For, for refeeds for me are an interesting one. I, I kind of used them a little bit in my first prep, but not really with my coach. Then they weren't really refeeds. It was kind of like high days and then, Oh, not high days. It was like medium deficit days to like really low deficit days. So none of them were really taken to maintenance. And then my 2017 prep, I didn't take any refeeds. I did diet breaks. So every deload, I'd actually come to maintenance for the entire week. Uh, and yeah, this time around, uh, I've been as ever, like you do, like thinking about these things much, much more. And I'm never going to be set on, you have to do this or you, you have to do it this way. Yeah. I'm much more open to using refe refeeds this time around. Um, after kind of learning more about them, seeing how particularly like 3DMJ have been using them with their athletes, I had that round table with Menno, Jackson, um, Alberto and Brian. And it was just like, ah, like actually it really changed my mind towards favoring utilizing refeeds a bit more. Right. So yeah, like you said, it depends on timelines. It depends on the physique, but 
uh, particularly using refeeds as a strategy to just keep kind of like topping up a little bit as you're feeling potentially like diet fatigue factors. If you're just like super low on energy, really drained, you're struggling to get through days, right. hungers through the roof or what have you. I think if you do like a just increase your food day rather than like a cheat meal day like that, it can be incredibly successful. So I'm I'm excited to try those as I get deeper in. Nice. Uh, and I, I probably will take kind of uh, maintenance and deloads probably for the most part together, unless I'm behind schedule. I, I'd like to take all of them there, but yeah, I'm sometimes, especially like you said, like I haven't given myself excess time. So if I fall behind, that's where I'd like to utilize those. But um, yeah, it's interesting to, Kind of just we're learning more like bill campbell published his study but i think we're never going to get a study that's perfect that we can just apply to every one of our clients like this perfect yeah. system so i really like that you said kind of it depends on the person how they respond to it what their time likes like the timelines like uh, yeah. and that will be the same for me if i kind of i think i might have to like send pascal some photos of me looking really shredded and he would fight and feeling awful and he like force me to have one because i think i'll be that person that just pushes through everything even when i shouldn't Gotcha. Yeah, man. And, and it's one of those things, like I know a lot of people are waiting on getting a randomized control trial that favors refeeds or doesn't, and then they just take that and run with it. But if we kind of take a step back from like looking at data, um, if you know that your performance is dropping throughout a contest prep, rather than like letting it continue to drop, like throw in, you know, multiple days at maintenance, recharge your battery if we know that maintaining performance or improving performance is going to be a massive part of retaining muscle, um, it just makes sense that there should be some sort of value there when it's used appropriately. Right. So, um, again, man, if, if performance is taking a big hit, then I would definitely consider utilizing it rather than just like, ah, oh, fuck, I just got to keep dieting down and I need to stay in this deficit and just like get weaker and weaker over time. You know, sometimes just recharging the battery for a little bit, can sustain you even longer than the amount of days that you know you were at maintenance for so it can be really beneficial hi guys steve here just wanted to take a moment of your time to remind you of our online coaching service at revive stronger we pride ourselves on providing personalized service that will take your physique and knowledge to the next level if you're interested check the description and sign up yeah i think uh, some people may have jumped to that conclusion that refeeds or diet breaks are just having those psychological impacts. It's like, I'm hardened, I can push through it. But like you say there, we know how important kind of glycogen, there's a reason we take like pre-workout like carbs and we plan our pre-post-workout things because we need that glycogen to perform well. Yeah. I mean, a bodybuilder that's under 10% getting towards essential body fat levels, I mean, they're some of the most depleted people ever. So to think that kind of taking multiple days or to restore glycogen levels isn't going to help performance yeah. i mean when i laid it out like that to myself i was like i mean uh, i don't really care what that study says that's definitely i know for myself that would help me train <laughs> so yeah, yeah. Uh, there's no doubt in my mind that's got to help with muscle retention which i mean you've got to be retaining your muscle to present it on stage you don't want to be drawn out <laughs> i was i was chatting with mike matthews like two weeks ago and um we we're talking a lot about nutrient timing and I just like, I, I went back to the like Helms's pyramid where, you know, nutrient timing is towards the top, but then supplements are at the very top. And I was stating that so many people, like there are certain people that say nutrient timing isn't that important or it doesn't matter. And I hate hearing that. And then those same exact people will like make sure that they're taking their pre-workout supplement. <laughs> You know, you're relying on like caffeine or beta alanine to give you like one or two extra reps, but you're not going to like give any value to making sure that pre-workout meal is as good as it can be. Because at that point, when we are depleted, like when glycogen is depleted and let's just say we're training chest and back, like we can't take glycogen from our quads while we're training chest and back to use it for our chest and back workout. And if we're depleted and there's not a lot of energy availability there, that pre-workout meal becomes so much more important because now you want blood glucose to be read like you want glucose to be uh, readily available in your bloodstream while you're training rather than like if you miss time that so let's say you ate your meal and then you didn't train for three hours later now you're back to like a true depleted state where you don't have muscle glycogen and your your glucose levels um, in your blood are lower so now you don't have a substrate to tap into and then your performance is going to be down so it's like 
you're putting so much value on a supplement, but you're not putting value on nutrient timing. I'm like, I just don't get it. Yeah, I think it's the, the pyramids are great because it always just allows you to kind of reorient yourself with what's actually important. And yeah. unfortunately, supplements often get way too much limelight uh, to what they really should because I guess they're just they're just sexy, aren't they? So yeah, um, actually on supplements, I guess it might be interesting as part of nutrition. Is there anything you're running differently for, a, for this contest prep or for fat loss? Is there anything you use that's different to massing or previous contest preps? Yeah, yeah. Um... It's interesting. I, I, I'm not putting like a ton of value into supplements right now. Um, I do start utilizing more supplements as the prep goes on. Um, and that's because there's a certain things that I don't, I don't like taking for a very long period of time. So let's just say I take a thermogenic. Um, I take like a stimulant free thermogenic that has five HTP in it. And, you know, it does really, really help with reducing appetite and, and just improving satiety like tremendously. And it improves my mood. Um, but with an ingredient like 5-HTP, I don't like taking it for more than eight to 12 consecutive weeks. And we don't really have like long-term data on how taking some of those substrates for a long period of time can impact like neurological chemistry and everything going on in the brain. So there are certain things I just kind of use it when I need it. Um, like if hunger is not an issue right now, I'm not going to just take a thermogenic cause I'm in conscious prep, you know? Um, but yeah, I was, I was actually, while you were chatting and we were talking about nutrient timing and supplements, I was going to ask you if you're utilizing intra workout carbs. Um, cause right now I do depending on the training session. Um, so if I'm doing more of a moderate repetition or higher repetition day, I'll be utilizing, um, some intra workout carbohydrates. But if I'm doing like something that is slightly more strength related, I might not utilize it just because I don't feel like putting those calories in them, um, especially if like my pre-workout meal was on point. Um, but yeah, we can we can chat about supplements, but I just want to point that out really quick. No, I think that's uh, really interesting. I know um, Ben Escrow developed Suppress with De Novo and that had 5-HTP in there for the exact mm -hmm. reason for that kind of appetite suppressant. And I like the idea that there is something in there that's like it's not um, a lot of them are like you said just caffeine based or they have loads of like green uh, green tea in there and that has loads of caffeine in it and you just yeah. i mean caffeine like uh, people I, I forget what the numbers were but i know in uh, andrew Chappelle's study like the average caffeine was like ridiculously high in terms of milligrams that bodybuilders was taking towards the end of prep and I mean, sleep is hard enough to come by, let alone you start eating into that. So I, I love things like the 5-HTP, like that only sounds logical. And I also like that you brought up like time courses because I think even like ashwagandha, I can't remember off the top of my head, but I think it's only been studied maybe for a maximum of similar, like 12 weeks or something. Yeah. So there's people that just like, oh, ashwagandha is great. There's good research behind it. I'll just take that year round. It's like, yeah. it's not like creatine that's literally been like research for that long term. Yeah. Sure. So it is get like just loads of things, I guess, um, like supplements that are coming out now and people just will take it. Uh, so yeah. I like the, the, the fact that you're even thinking about that. Cause I think a lot of people wouldn't even think about it. Um, sure. I am doing intra workout carbs or oh, an intra workout. So I do some dextro 20 grams of dextrose with 10 grams of whey isolate. And I take my creatine in there as well with right. a little bit of salt. <laughs> um, nice. so that's like my intra workout at the moment, but that's mostly because I train twice a day. Um, but oh, I have, wow. I've seen, so I split my yeah, sessions in two basically. So I do like my compounds in the morning, isolations in the evening. So like if my triceps are a bit tired from chest in the morning, they're better by the evening. And I have some carbs that I've like replenished them very quickly. Nice. But I, I found even if I wasn't doing that intra workouts, oh, I mean, the time they become most valuable is probably the time you least want to start using them because yeah. that's in a cut. And especially deep in prep when you're so depleted, For you don't sure. want to put the calories towards it though. How's yeah. yours looking? Yeah. Um, right now I use only like 20 grams of carbs right now. I'm using Gatorade to dextrose. Um, I do have like highly branched cyclic dextrin, but it, it doesn't make a difference to me. Like I don't have digestive issues. Likewise. Dextrose. Yeah. Um, and I mix it with whey isolate actually. So I usually do like 10 to 15 grams of whey isolate. Um, I don't use like an EAA or a BCAA or anything like that, just the way I isolate. Um, and sometimes I add some salt as well. And that's really it. Um, I have experimented with pomegranate juice as well. In oh, yeah. workout. 
Um, and the thing that's pretty cool about that is it's approximately 50% glucose, 50% fructose. So for me, the digestion on that's really good. And then you might get some nitrates in there so it can help with like basal dilation and pump and stuff. Um, so I have used pomegranate juice as well um, instead of utilizing the Gatorade powder, but it's actually quite pricey. So the Gatorade powder is way cheaper. Um, that pomegranate juice, I forget what I pay for it, but you know, you get maybe like eight servings in this large glass container and it's, it's like an expensive thing. So, um, cost per serving is way better with Gatorade. Yeah. I think I, I tried a juice. It might've been, I don't know. I don't know if it was pomegranate, it might've been cherry or something. It was similar to what you yeah. described there, but I remember the amount that I could have for the carbs I was going for was like nothing. And then I had, I wanted more like fluid <laughs> and uh, I was just like, this now tastes like yeah, yeah. water. <laughs> so I was just like, I'll stick with my, like the flavorings that I get from all these different powders. Like you said, all the sweeteners in there. <laughs> yeah, man. Like a uh, pomegranate juice and cherry tart juice are two like amazing liquid carb sources when you're bulking. Cause you literally put like four ounces and you're getting like 40 carbs or something yeah. ridiculous. I forget the exact number. So I usually dilute it and just add a bunch of water. So I have more fluid with it. Um, but yes, yeah, that's, that's funny. You said that, um, in regards to supplements right now, it's pretty basic, man. Um, I do take, I do fasted cardio on my non-training days right now. So at that time I usually do, um, I take this supplement called Forge, but it's basically Yohimbine and HMB combined. Um, and I take that with either a cup of green tea or a cup of coffee on the side, just to get a little bit of caffeine. And then I do my fasted cardio. Um, otherwise, I'm just literally using creatine post-workout, plenty of whey protein with, with my meals, um, a standard pre-workout, but I actually alter the dosage depending on my training day. Um, and what else am I taking? Um, I take like an herbal, I take an herbal extract it's called Testo Jack 200 by now, just like Korean ginseng, um, a bunch of different herbals. There might be rhodiola rosea in there. So nothing crazy, man. Like I'm not taking a bunch of supplements right now. Um, and then my, my standard multivitamin and fish oil, but I eat a lot of salmon. So um, depending on the day, I don't even take the fish oil kind yeah. of depends. Yeah. Sounds very smart. And, uh, yeah, rhodiola is one of those. I remember, uh, talking to Greg Potter about like my overreaching week and what could I do to like help me in like when I'm just like completely wrecked, he was like, maybe try rhodiola rather than like pumping the caffeine really high, yeah. uh, because it can help with fatigue in some ways. And it, interesting that's on the HMB as well, because I know that's one I took in a previous prep and it tastes awful so hopefully the supplement you've got it tastes all right with it because i just remember it and i was like this is i don't know it's the worst tasting supplement i ever had <laughs> i've had the powder in the past yeah. but the one i currently take is pill form so yeah it's mask which is great but rhodiola is amazing pre-workout it's really it's a really great supplement pre-workout man and i know the hmb from as far as i know it's one of those that's like there's some research that's not like direct on like weight training bodybuilders but there's some research within like helping defend against sarcopenia. So I guess that's why you're kind of going that route. Yeah, man. Um, the data on HMD is, I honestly think it's quite strong, but it's just not in our demographic. Yeah. I can share some of those results with you. Um, I recall coming off, uh, coming across some studies where they were supplementing with HMD with people that, um, broke a limb and they were casted. So, they were immobilized. And obviously when you're immobilized, you're going to lose a significant amount of, you know, lean body mass in that area. And they found that HMB, you know, significantly reduced the reductions in lean body mass that they lost while being immobilized. So I saw that data. I thought it was cool. Um, and we know that it's a metabolite of leucine, but for us to get like the anti-catabolic effects that we're seeing in the research from HMB, we would need to consume a insane amount of animal protein. Like you would have to consume basically like 350 grams of protein uh, to get, you know, 2.5 grams of HMB um, through your food. So, you know, taking it in supplement form, it definitely can't hurt. And there is some data suggesting that it can be beneficial to prevent losing lean body mass while being in a deficit. So, um, yeah, I, I utilize it. And as I get further along prep, I'll take that same exact supplement that I'm utilizing right now, just for fasted cardio. I'll start taking a pre-workout. 
Um, but I just don't feel like it's necessary right now because my body fat levels are still at a higher place and I'm, I'm not like concerned about losing muscle in this current state that I'm in. Yeah. Yeah. I think if it's, it's kind of one of those where if you've got the budget for it and you're happy to invest, then like yeah. go there. But if you're kind of like, uh, pinching pennies is probably not one that you'd be like, oh yeah, I definitely you have to use all your kind of spare cash to put towards HMB. Um, it's one I maybe it's one I'll consider. I just picked up some betaine because I had been looking a bit more into that. I was like, oh, maybe I'll try some betaine. Uh, mm -hmm. It's in prep. I always end up getting a bit more like think about these little details where I'm like, oh yeah, yeah, yeah maximize everything. Yeah. Um, so yeah, it's interesting to hear that you're taking that. And I, just an interesting one with your hymn bone. Do you ever notice any of the kind of anxiety producing effects? Is that something that you ever deal with? I guess like you could take that and then you're taking your like HMB, maybe some ashwagandha <laughs> to like counteract it. I don't even know who knows yeah. how these things interact, but yeah, no, personally, I never had that, uh, sensation from Yohimbein, but a lot of clients experience it. And in that case, I just tell them not to take it. Like, yeah. I don't think that the benefit that you potentially get from it is worth like not feeling well for 60 minutes while doing cardio. Like I'd rather you enjoy your cardio and uh, not feel like crap then oh you need to take this this supplement that's you know barely doing anything anyway it's giving you like the slightest slightest advantage um so yeah it, it's no big deal cool amazing yeah. chris we've been an hour i could probably talk to you for another hour because we haven't even touched on your training maybe we'll have to get you on to talk about that another time and i mean get you on to talk about uh, like i said i want to get you on more times for sure in future but it's been great just um hearing about your prep what you're doing but obviously tons of takeaways for the listeners as well for their clients or preps or even just fat loss phases i think as well so i appreciate you taking the time thank to come you so on much, man no it was it's always uh, a very pleasurable conversation man Good. so thank you for having me on and i look forward to uh continuing this discussion at, at a later date Awesome. And if people want to find out more with you, keep stay along with your prep. I don't know if you're, are you documenting it particularly or are you going to be sharing yeah. bits over on Instagram here and there? You, is it Kai Green who always hides himself? <laughs> Dude, it's, it's, that's funny you mentioned that. I, uh, I've been like having this internal conflict with whether I want to share a lot of my prep or not share anything. Um, like I mentioned in the very beginning, there's something about it that's like very uh, intimate and at the same time, I feel really selfish if I'm not sharing it because I know I can provide just good experience and value by documenting it. So um, I do plan on sharing it. I'm working with a videographer to put together some episodes cool. throughout the prep, but it's one of those things where like, I'm not a hundred percent sure about, but yeah, you should be able to get more content in regards to the prep. Um, I am most active on Instagram. I haven't been super active lately, but it's just my full name at uh, Christopher.Barricat. And then my website is schoolofgains.com. Uh, Gains is spelt with a Z. And I might um, <clears throat> have some like exclusive content on there related to the prep. So definitely be sure to check that out. And then uh, for anybody that is more focused on competition prep, you can also check out competitivebreed.com. That was my, my first brand and still is my coaching brand. And then School of Gains is kind of the uh, larger umbrella that is more educational based. Cool. So yeah, you guys find me there. Amazing. Yeah, I think uh, I would be encouraging you to share. Selfishly, <laughs> that's what I'd want. But I absolutely know the conflict because I think everyone who's slightly in the social media game and kind of content producer feels that if they're a competitor because you kind of feel obliged to, but it takes a lot from you as well. And it's quite nice to be selfish with it <laughs> yeah, at the man. same time. I'm going to try to balance it. I want to, I want to share an appropriate amount where it's definitely beneficial. I also don't want to get to the end of prep and say it's over. And I didn't share anything for yeah. even myself to reflect back upon. Um, so I think it makes sense that I, I really should be sharing it um, for a lot of reasons. So yeah, I appreciate the encouragement to do so. Hopefully, hopefully I take that to heart and, and get it done. I mean, yeah, I, I'd love it personally. And I think uh, you'll probably get a lot of the listeners nodding their heads and loving to see that too, because it, it's always great to see, because you don't see, a lot of people don't. So, it, and I know you're well thought out with everything you're doing. So I think people will appreciate that a lot. But again, massive thank you for coming on, Chris. I'll make sure everything is linked below and uh, we'll talk to you soon, guys. Take care. Thanks so much, Steve. Thank you.
So I'm Steve Hall, founder of Revive Stronger and a coach of Revive Stronger. My name is Pascal Flor. I'm the co-owner of Revive Stronger and also a coach, of course. The Revive Stronger has probably been going solidly for three years, probably roughly about three years. Revive Stronger to me, it is becoming kind of my child, my foster child. It's the gathering and getting together of like-minded people. We've been expanding the coaching team, which is helping us help more people, uh, but each coach can only help a certain number of people. Right now, it's all over the place. We have YouTube, we have Facebook, we have Instagram, but there isn't that community aspect behind that. And so the next step for us is developing a membership site. So basically we want to create a family and a community that is then benefiting from another. A really cool community for people within our little niche is gonna be a website. They will get early access to our podcast. You can access us, ask us questions, the community aspect. We have a forum there, you can ask questions, but also you can, you can lock your journey. It's also gonna be courses on there, courses, presentations on different topics. Discount of past seminar footage. We will log our journey as well. We'll start vlogging. We're gonna have documentaries, our entire athletic journey. Furthermore, they get access to an exercise video library. The exercises that we love for hypertrophy and maximizing hypertrophy, we're gonna go through those in depth, telling you how to execute them. We kept them concise and also mobile friendly so that you can watch them in between your sets. I'm super excited to grow this community. The amount of value that we're gonna be delivering is huge. And I'd love you to be part of it. You will get so much out of that. I'll see you inside.